Jonesboro and Washington County have a strong African-American history. Prior to the Civil War, both enslaved and free people of color called Washington County home. In the 1860 census, there were 952 enslaved people in Washington County. At the same time, there were more free people of color in Washington County than there were in the entire state of Arkansas. Members of the enslaved population fought in the Battle of Kings Mountain during the Revolutionary War alongside their enslavers, and they worked in Jonesboro's hotels like the Chester Inn and on the farms of the larger landowners in Washington County. Washington County also had a strong abolitionist movement led by the Quakers in the late 1700s and early 1800s. The Emancipator, published and funded by Quaker Elihu Embry, began circulation on April 30, 1820. The Emancipator was the first periodical dedicated exclusively to the cause of abolitionism. Jacob Howard's print shop, now destroyed, stood on the corner of Main Street and First Avenue in Jonesboro's historic district. The paper had seven editions and readership in Boston and Philadelphia. Elihu Embry passed away in December of 1820. In his will, Embry sought to manumit his enslaved woman, Nancy, and her five children. In stark contrast to his beliefs, Embry was an enslaver for most of his life. He was honest to a degree about his shortcomings in The Emancipator. Despite these shortcomings, his paper helped influence and champion the cause of abolitionism. In 1842, Washington County farmer Lloyd Ford Sr., passed away and left a large amount of his estate to his enslaved people and children, including Peggy, Rhoda, and Edward. He also manumitted them in his will. His white children protested the will, and the case went first to the Washington County Court before making it to the Tennessee Supreme Court. Ford's enslaved heirs were not allowed to stand trial, so Phoebe Stewart, a white woman, agreed to be their next friend and testify on their behalf. In his final judgment, Supreme Court Justice Nathan Green upheld the decision of the Washington County Court and ruled in favor of Peggy, Rhoda, and Edward, saying, A slave is not in the condition of a horse or an ox. His liberty is restrained, it is true. But he is made after the image of the Creator. He has mental capacities and an immortal principle in his nature that constitute him equal to his owner, before the accidental position in which fortune has placed him. Finally, in 1850, Ford's enslaved children gained their freedom and their rightful portion of the estate. Today, members of the Ford family, both black and white, gather for a family reunion. Following the Civil War, Union Army veteran and formerly enslaved person Jeremiah Edwards established a school and church in Jonesboro for the black community. Alfred Martin Ray and his twin brother, John Ray, were also born into enslavement. They were enslaved by Dr. Joseph Ray and were most likely his biological children. After the Civil War and Emancipation, Alfred enlisted in the U.S. Army. He was part of the 10th U.S. Cavalry, known as the Buffalo Soldiers. He fought in the Spanish-American War at the Battle of San Juan Hill, where he was credited with helping carry the American flag to the top of the hill. In 1898, he married Etta Smith of Jonesboro, and when he retired from the armed forces, after over 20 years, they settled in town on West Woodrow Avenue. He passed away on July, July 11, 1917, and is buried in College Hill Cemetery. In 1874, James C. Cousins and James A. Bailey ran for trustee and register in the local election. They were the first African Americans to run for office in Jonesboro. James C. Cousins was a barber, and his barber shop was on Main Street near the courthouse. He also owned a candy store. The two men were ultimately defeated in the election, but the Herald and Tribune reported on their historic run, saying, They are both industrious men, and their claims are entitled to consideration. In 1876, Yardley Warner opened the Warner Institute, a school for the freedmen at the top of East Main Street. Jonesboro has always been committed to education. In addition to schools for boys, the town housed the Holston Baptist Female Institute and the Odd Fellows Female Academy. 
Following the Civil War, Yardley Warner worked with the Friends Freedmen's Association to establish a school for people recently manumitted from enslavement in Jonesboro. The school was maintained until 1887 by teacher and principal Julia Bullard Nelson. Nelson was very firm in her beliefs, and she had an ongoing war of words and opinions with the Jonesboro Journal. In one of her replies to them, she stated, I do believe that a black heart is infinitely worse than a black skin. In 1895, Miss Cordy Bayless became the first alumnus from the school to be a teacher there. She was Jeremiah Edwards' granddaughter. The school continued to serve the African-American community until 1917 when it was sold and became a private residence. The brick house still stands today beside the old Jonesboro Cemetery. Speaking of cemeteries, in 1896, the Colored People's Cemetery Society established College Hill Cemetery at the top of East Main Street as a final resting place for the African-American community. The town's public burying ground was laid out in 1803 and called Rocky Hill. College Hill is located behind Rocky Hill and was accessible by Boone Street and Cemetery Lane. Prior to College Hill Cemetery, African Americans were restricted to burial in the back section and slope of Rocky Hill. Society and nature segregated the two cemeteries, but those boundaries have been removed, and today the two cemeteries can be viewed one from the other. They are commonly referred to as the Old Jonesboro Cemetery. Their stories are shared together on cemetery tours and ongoing preservation efforts continue to take place. At the same time the cemetery was founded, Nurse Ella Russell, a graduate of Howard Medical Training School in Washington, D.C., was advertising herself as the only hospital trained nurse in East Tennessee. She resided with James C. Cousins in his house on West Main Street. She was his live-in nurse, but she was ready at any time to go when called upon. An African-American woman, she treated both black and white patients and was recommended by local physicians, including doctors J.S. Stewart, T.W. Whitlock, and Niles N. Warlick. When Mr. Cousins passed away, he left Ella his house as back payment for his medical debts. Ella sold the property on the corner of West Main and First Avenue, the same location of Elihu Embry's historic paper, and moved to Washington, D.C. with her husband. After the Warner Institute closed, African-American students attended the Jonesboro Colored School. The Booker T. Washington School opened on October 7, 1940 to students from the African-American community. The school was a Works Progress Administration project and it replaced the Jonesboro Colored School, also known as the School on the Rocks, on Spring Street. The school housed grades 1st through 8th. African-American students had to be bused to Johnson City to the segregated high school at Langston. Booker T. Washington School closed in 1965 when Washington County Schools were finally integrated. Today, the building belongs to the town of Jonesboro and is an arts center for the entire community. It is named in honor of the McKinney family and their legacy. Ernest McKinney was a teacher and principal at the school from 1956 to 57. On the same day that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Ernest McKinney was elected alderman in Jonesboro. Mr. McKinney was the first African American to be elected to the board of mayor and aldermen. His wife, Marion McKinney, was instrumental in the fight to, de to desegregate Washington County schools and worked as a guidance counselor within the system for a number of years. In 1988, their son, Kevin McKinney, was elected mayor of Jonesboro. Alfred Greenlee worked for the War Department for a number of years and was a friend to all. He was superintendent of the department. He left a lasting legacy on the town of Jonesboro. He walked the town daily, and there's a bench outside the Washington County Courthouse dedicated to him. It reminds people to take a moment to stop and smile. These are only a handful of stories from the rich African-American history of Washington County. There are so many more stories to be told.